Good evening. Welcome to the 300th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Stories Symposium. It's, this is a weekly lecture series on comics, animation, illustration, and other text image work. It's sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight is art historian, artist, and activist, Catherine Desplanc. She is a specialist in 18th and 19th century European visual culture and is currently on a Banting postdoctoral fellowship at Carleton University in Ottawa. And uh, will take up a position as assistant professor um, of 18th and 19th century European art at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2021. Uh, Catherine approaches visual culture studies through the lens of material culture studies and the sociology of art to examine the tensions and contradictions elicited by financial capitalism's impact on the art world. Her writings can be found in 18th century studies, the mediatization of the artist, and Rakar, the Canadian Art Review. She, she serves on the board of directors for Ottawa's Digital Arts Resource Center and on the research advisory board for the qualitative data analysis company, QSR International. So here's Catherine on art world satire in print during the 18th and 19th centuries. Take it away. Right. Thanks, Ben. It's so nice to be in this room virtually with all of you, although it's also very strange, but I think, you know, it's our new normal. Um, but I'm really happy to see so many different participants from all across North America and so many familiar faces. Hello, everyone. Um, and I'm so delighted to be invited to this, this wonderful talk series and to get to tell you about my work. Let me start off by telling you a story. A long, long time ago, when I was but a child completing her master's degree, I boarded a flight and set off for Paris to visit the French National Library. I was on the hunt for a satirical image. Well, that's not quite it. I was on the hunt for another edition of a satirical image I'd already found. Actually, it was found by William McAllister Johnson, the late renowned specialist of the study of the 18th century French printed image and an avid collector of such imagery who donated it alongside the rest of his glorious collection to Carleton University. Not Carleton College, Carleton University, entirely unrelated, located in Ottawa, Ontario, the little known capital of Canada, although most of our audience is Ottawan, so you all know this, and the city where I was raised. Johnson and my MA supervisor, Stéphane Roy, were planning to conduct a study of this unknown but very important and fascinating image when Stéphane decided to include it in a seminar I took. I instantly fell in love. Nay, I became obsessed with trying to understand this graphic satire, which entirely eluded my comprehension sidestepping everything that I, I had learned in my undergraduate degree about how to understand an image. As you all know, I have since gone on to conduct a study of 530 satirical images from around the same period as this one, but I have never studied an image the way I studied the one before you now. In deciphering this image, I became a historical detective, obsessively following every lead, and those leads led me everywhere. I pored over historical dictionaries and visual dictionaries of emblematic and iconographic imagery. I rummaged through the art criticism of Denis Diderot and through the anonymous art critical pamphlets handed out on the steps of the Louvre Palace before the Biennial Salon Exhibition of Contemporary Art. Through mid-century French scholarship long overlooked by contemporary scholars, through pamphlets written by engravers on the vicissitudes of the 18th century French print trade, I dove down rabbit holes from which I cannot with confidence say I have ever quite resurfaced. I fell in love with libraries, the 18th century, 
French art world, the printed image and graphic satire because of a funny cartoon that my mentor Stefan and his mentor, dear Mac Johnson, decided to throw onto a list of cool things some grad students might take a peek at. And I handed in to poor Stefan, who is here tonight to verify, a packed wall-to-wall -wall 30 page paper overflowing with absolutely every single shred of evidence I found. Don't worry, I won't repeat my mistake here. The Coles Notes version is that this image satirizes the renowned 18th century genre painter Jean-Baptiste Greuze, whom Parisian audiences praised for his sensitively rendered images of bourgeois life and eroticized images of young girls, but whose career had since attracted criticism. Critics' accusations of greed and ambition and of a tempestuous disposition are echoed in this satire. Greuze's profile was once pinned to a now fated obelisk of virtue, crowned with a wreath of laurels that celebrated his accomplishments, but it is now transformed into a whistle crowned with a wreath of thistles and titled vanity. Accordingly, his profile is adorned with peacock feathers and his head opened to reveal a brainless skull. At the base of the obelisk is an image of a straight to print work he produced called La Belle Mère, or the stepmother. This print published in 1781 is the catalyst for this satire. Greuze paid the young engraver, Jean-Charles Levasseur, a fraction of what he had paid other engravers with which he worked to reproduce his paintings as engravings. It is for this reason that we find the head of Jean-Charles Levasseur pinned below Greuze's topping obelisk, struggling to support it. My obsession with this image is what brought me to the French National Library. An early 20th century article that mentioned my caricature against Greuze included an image of it, or rather an image of another edition of my satire. It became clear that the Carleton University edition was only the first edition of this caricature, which had been so popular that the copper plate was exhausted and it had to be entirely reinscribed on a separate copper plate and reprinted. I scoured the French National Library's collection every day for two weeks before I finally located what I had begun to suspect might only be a mythical second edition of the satire. I only succeeded because of the help of a librarian who in the years since this search, I have only seen again once. She directed me to a little known collection of 12 folios entitled Pieces on the Arts and which contained like the satire against Creuse undated, anonymous, cheap, satirical, and popular imagery that mocked or depicted the French art world. These folios were essentially a kind of scrapbook of odds and ends that the French National Library's late 19th and early 20th century print conservators tossed together into an odd collaged compilation around the theme of the visual arts. Thanks to art historian and documentarian Judith Wexler, I would later discover that Frankfurt School theorist Walter Benjamin was amongst the first to rediscover this little known collection of folios when he was working on his arcades project between the world wars. Recognizing my obsession with this image, Stefan and McAllister Johnson generally yielded their study project, leaving it to me to finish and disseminate it. It eventually became the basis for my MA thesis, an article published in 18th century studies, and ultimately the basis for my PhD dissertation, which has now become my major field of study and the book project I'm sharing with you today. Because when I finally found the second edition of the caricature I'd obsessed over for almost a year, my obsession had already been replaced by the set of 12 folios that encased it. I became enthralled by all 12 folios, which I requested and perused and raptured by the imagery contained therein and delighted by the possibility that I was going to be able to find more images like my beloved Greur's caricature. The caricature against Greur's though impenetrable to me when I first discovered it, otherwise mapped fairly neatly onto my expectations as a student of art history. It, like the art historical canon, was preoccupied with the oeuvre, the reputation, and the biography of a single artist, one that was renowned in his time and who we still customarily include in survey courses and in art history textbooks. But the satirical imagery I found in the pieces on the arts folios had very different concerns and preoccupations which became clear to me the more of them I examined and I found exactly 99 of interest to me across the 12 folios. 
This imagery did not satirize individual renowned artists, but rather targeted the structures that make up an entire art world. Relationships between the art academy, the art guild, their art exhibitions, their art students, the art markets, connoisseurs, patrons, and so on. Let me show you. Nestled into the second tome of the pieces on the arts folios are these images that picture the artist assailed by a braying and clucking monstrous public who scream and cry their unsolicited opinions on the artwork before them. These satires give voice to the shock and discomfort of artists and arts administrators. When regular public exhibitions of contemporary art began to attract pamphlets, voice and commentary and art criticism, which at that time was a new genre of cultural production. These images from tome 10 and tome two of the folios are preoccupied with the Louvre Palace's transformation into the first modern public museum for the arts during the French Revolution and Napoleon's multifaceted role in this transformation. On the left, Amour des Arts, or Love of the Arts, mocks Napoleon's 1798 triumphal entry into the city of Paris, where he displayed the spoils of his Italian campaigns during the Revolutionary Wars, when Napoleon was not yet emperor of France, but rather a celebrated military general. This and other images participated in a vociferous debate where artists and connoisseurs questioned whether art objects should be displaced from their original contexts, a discussion we continue to have to this day. On the right, once Napoleon had declared himself emperor, he quickly renamed the Louvre Museum or the Central Museum of Arts as it was then known, calling it the Musée Napoléon and in so doing violating his own adherence to French revolutionary ideals of equality, liberty, and fraternity by aping the narcissistic tendencies of the toppled Bourbon monarchy. Later in tome 10 of the folios, I discovered satires that mocked the art connoisseur and collector of art, L'amateur de tableau en extase, or the painting amateur in ecstasy, shows us an art collector who believes he has stumbled upon a masterpiece on the streets of Paris. Our art seller's malicious grin, arched eyebrows, devil horned hat, and curving pig like ponytail suggest to us that our art amateur has made no such discovery at all. On the right, our bourgeois art collector in this 1840 lithograph enjoys his eclectic collection of objects, but takes particular pride in the plump posterior of an androgynous fragment of classical statuary. Under the guise of careful and considered examination and study, our collector wields his loop, his lips pursing in titillation as he admires his latest prize. Or in tome six of the folios, when the image of the Bohemian artist began to appear. In Granville's image on the left, the Bohemian artist festoons himself in odd and anachronistic dress, ornate facial hair, long hairstyles, Renaissance hats, and gratuitous walking sticks. And in Les Genies Méconnus, or the Unknown Geniuses, our bohemian artist, not unlike satires of the hipster artist of yesteryear, lounges about smoking profusely, trapped in collective existential dread, as they indulge in romantic, with a capital R, revelries. Our artists here are so intent on looking like, seeming like, and acting like artists that they cannot find the time to actually be artists and make art. Perhaps some of these images had implicit individual targets in mind, but overwhelmingly the cartoonists that produced them were primarily engaged in a debate, not about the actions of individuals, but rather about the changing shape of the art world and the relations between institutions and players within that world. Indeed, our cartoonists were active participants in that art world. In the period that I study from the mid 18th to the mid 19th century, one could generally not expect to make a living as a political cartoonist, nor did the category exist as its own visible profession. The political cartoon was still a nascent emerging genre. These early cartoonists had trained in elite studios and had burgeoning art careers and aspired to be successful fine artists. Their satirical imagery sought to render visible the invisible structural relations of a world that they participated in. Reconsidering the images I've shown you in that light, we can see how they questioned who should have authority in the aesthetic evaluation of visual art. Should art critics exist at all? And should they defer to the authority of the academy or the artist when making judgments? 
What is this modern art museum and how should we fill it? With the spoils of foreign wars to serve as monuments to conquest or rulership? Has the birth of a new middle class released a bunch of idiots into the art market who can't tell the difference between cheap and popular works and works of fine art? Or whose motivations for artistic collection are compromised, selfish, and threaten to interfere with the progress of the arts? And who is this new genre of increasingly visible romantic artist? And are they geniuses or charlatans? Artists whose careers were precarious and who pursued political cartooning as an alternative outlet for creative expression and financial gain employed this satirical genre to grapple with structural change during an extremely turbulent period in French history. One where we are practiced in considering the political and economic ramifications of political revolution or the industrial revolution or the emergence of modern financial capitalism but where there is still much work to be done in mapping out the cultural ramifications of such transitions. Or perhaps more accurately still, where we are accustomed to celebrating these transitions rather than critiquing them as our satirists did. In this period, the Parisian art world witnessed the emergence of new phenomenon that is old hat to us now. Contemporaries essentially witnessed the emergence of a modern art world. Regular exhibitions of contemporary art were held beginning in 1737 in the Salon Carré of the Louvre, Louvre Palace. Art critics emerged in droves to comment on these exhibitions. The category of visual artist was exempted from requiring guild affiliation to legally make art in 1776. The supremacy of art academies within the landscape of the art world was definitively destabilized when they were shuttered during the French Revolution in 1793. That same year, the modern public art museum appeared in the now renowned Louvre Museum, Paris's first public museum to permanently display contemporary art appeared in 1818, named the Museum of Living Artists or Musée des Artistes Vivants. Hold on, I'm gonna admit someone from the weight room mid-talk um, because he's my best friend. An art market comprised of galleries and art dealers proliferated in the early 19th century. Uh, hold on a second, there we go. Buoyed by the appearance of a museum of contemporary art and cultural writers and art critics increasingly professionalized as publications dedicated exclusively to arts and, um, and culture multiplied. And this is only a glimpse of these changes. We are more accustomed to seeing this period celebrated for the emergence of a modern art world, which we describe as having liberated the artists from the guild, from the academy and from royal and religious patronage. Indeed, we perhaps possess an ideological investment in this narrative, which implicitly aligns the emergence of a free market for art with the artist's liberation and paints the emergence of competitive individualism as a precursor to expressive freedom. My examination of the 12 pieces on the arts folios pointed to a very different interpretation of this familiar narrative. I began to note the appearance of a figure that we commonly know now as the starving artist, and which in my book I label the inglorious artist, a disheveled and destitute, desperate and sometimes delusional artist perpetually impoverished and who fails to acclimatize to the rapid structural transformations of his age. This bedraggled revolutionary artist paints an image of a knife grinder, which at the time in French was called a gagne petit, translating literally to earns little. We barely need the pun to apply the label of destitution to this artist whose pre-revolutionary finery is rotting on his body. His silk stockings slip down his legs, his habit or overcoat is full of holes, his tricorn hat perched on his easel is frayed at the corners. One last remaining emblem of his former glory dangles off the back of his chair, an ornamentary sword, which only nobility were permitted to wear in the pre-revolutionary period, but which fine artists were exceptionally allowed to carry in deference to the dignity of their vocation. Similarly, this portrait painter sports all the mm -hmm. same signs of destitution in his disintegrating dress. His poverty is further indicated by the gaggle of creditors who harass him as he works for unpaid debts. From left to right, his landlord, a baker and a soldier, the latter perhaps the sitter of his portrait whom he endeavors to repay with his talents. 
A generation later, Nicolas Toussaint Charlet provides a fitting epilogue to our story. Our bohemian painter in the long coat with his eclectic dress and hair unhappily carries his paintings and palette in one in his arms. A hired mover um, assists with the rest of our painter's scanty possessions while the painter's landlord stares angrily down her glasses, having presumably just evicted him for failure to pay his rent. Eugène Le Poitvin's 1833 image makes this dynamic explicit. A string of artists carrying their paintings rush after a building labeled the Musée Royal. The familiar facade of the Luxembourg Museum, then known as the Museum of Living Artists, would have been recognizable to contemporaries. In this allegorical scene, our artists chase after a moving target that the devil happily keeps just out of reach as his minions prepare to toss obstacles in the way of our artists. In the upper left-hand corner, our impoverished artist burns his artwork to stay warm. This journey through the pieces on the arts folios revealed several things to me. Firstly, a subgenre that I call art world satire was rampant in the 18th and 19th centuries. This imagery is dedicated to critiquing the art world. And though I use sociologist Howard S. Beckard's term, which is much more familiar to English speaking ears, I am here using art world in the sense of his colleague, Pierre Bourdieu's notion of the cultural field, one which possesses a political economy in which members within, membership within the art world is gate kept, members of the art world engage in processes of position taking or vying for power, recognition and renown. A world where invisible rules dictate the conditions for success, prosperity, and influence. And secondly, that the protagonists of this genre are not actual living and breathing artists, but rather the idea of the artist. Art world satire in its struggle to make visible the structural relations of the art world introduced and popularized the enduring image of the struggling artist or glorious artist offered as a counterpoint to dominant notions of the proto-romantic and romantic artist, an artist amply rewarded for his dedication and celebrated for his quiddities. In contrast, the inglorious artist labors in poverty, dies in indignity, and is either an untalented charlatan or whose talent is never even posthumously recognized. This is where the other 431 art world satires come in. I needed to know more. How many more art world satires exist? Would I continue to see these themes and this preoccupation with structural change in the art world playing out across them? How would these themes evolve over time? I had no idea how many images I would find, but my two week search for the caricature against Greurs gave me a roadmap to the many other places I could search at the French National Library. I explored their collections methodically, requesting dozens of folios and scouring thousands of images. I continued my search at the Musée Carnavalet, a municipal museum of the history of Paris, and the Museum of the French Revolution tucked away in Visil near Grenoble. I ultimately discovered 530 images scrolling past you now. My mentors cautioned me that I had already overwhelmed myself, that I should narrow the scope of my project, that I should stop hunting, I did after all have to write a 200 or so page dissertation on 530 images. I briefly contemplated whether I should just dedicate a paragraph or two to describing each image and call it a day. Instead, I expanded my search. To satirical popular imagery, I added popular satirical text. I began to hunt for the struggling artist and art world satire in the world of popular theater, comic opera and vaudeville, and in the world of popular short writing, comedic pamphlets, panoramic fiction, and so on. My art world satirical imagery led me there. Many of my images borrowed characters from the stage and the page. Ultimately, I found some 70 examples of satirical popular theater and text. I was too far down the rabbit hole by now to consider narrowing my study. I felt that I had opened Pandora's box and that I could not pretend otherwise. I wanted to trace the full arc of the story these 530 images told, but I wanted as much as possible to do so without cherry picking, without selecting those images that befit my narrative and ignoring the rest. I wanted to listen to them all carefully. From a purely pragmatic standpoint, I truly was over, were as impenetrable to me then as the Gurs satire once was, but far less enthralling.
Realizing that I had assembled enough images to open my own museum and that I was lost in attempting to organize them, I sought to create a virtual collection of them so that I could navigate them, make sense of them, and eventually share what I had found. After exploring FileMaker, Microsoft Access, and other accessible relational database software, I discovered a set of tools that qualitative sociologists use, qualitative data analysis software. The video you're watching now is a brief tour of my database and a utility called Envivo. I'm sure you are all by now entirely unsurprised that my journey down the rabbit hole brought me here, a library junkie constructing her own personal library collection. I took down bibliographic information for each of my images, most of which had not been individually cataloged by their libraries, and I essentially constructed my own subject headings thesaurus so that I could conduct iconographic identifications and analyses of these 530 objects and trace their overlaps. And you're seeing here on screen me sort of expanding um, those categories that I just referred to. This process was not at all automated. I defined my own iconographic taxonomies, applied them individually by hand, and developed an intimate knowledge of the 530 objects that comprised my art world satire corpus. And I could now begin to ask questions of these images, questions of interest to the print historian in me. When do intaglio images give way to lithographic images? When do I notice a spike in these images augmented by hand coloring? Hold on a sec. Um, who are the most prominent publishers and printers of these images and questions of interest to my larger research inquiry. Um, and you're seeing me here on screen querying my database. Um, questions of interest to my larger research inquiry. What kind of tropes and types do my satirists invent and popularize to criticize the art world? How do they appear, branch, and transform over time? Who do we see in this imagery and who don't we see? This research process allowed me to produce a genealogy of art world satire's starving artist and his relationship to the art world. In the old regime, before the French Revolution, when the Bourbon monarchy reigned and jurisdiction over the Parisian art world was divided between the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture and the Guild of Master Painters, the inglorious artist first makes his appearance and the most frequent art world antagonist is the connoisseur an avid and ennobled collector of images. This presumption of the artist's poverty predates the 1776 declaration from the king that all fine artists can practice their art without requiring membership in either the guild or the academy. In this 1760 image, we see the Arbre de Cracovie or the tree of Krakow, a large tree formerly in the gardens of the Palais Royal, just north of the Louvre Palace, where groups of all classes would gather to gossip. In this panorama of the Parisian social landscape, our familiar and glorious artist appears. Aspiring to a noble status outside of his reach, his fine dress betrays his poverty and is in tatters. The painter is the only figure in this image in such a state of disarray, even amongst the images of other artists. In writing and in image, the connoisseur appears as the most frequent antagonist to the progress of the arts and the achievement of the artist. A scene now familiar to us plays out. The connoisseur believes himself to have stumbled upon a masterpiece amongst the bric-a-brac of Parisian street merchants. In this case, an image of a half-naked working class woman levitating by the power of her flatulence. The lettering below the image offers the naive connoisseur, uh, connoisseur stream of consciousness. He believes that not even Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun, who from the 1770s onwards was one of Paris's leading art experts and head of a successful auction house enterprise, would have noticed this masterpiece. Old regime satire introduced the starving artist trope to popular audiences while expressing a deep set concern about the growth of art audiences and patrons. In the French Revolution, the image of the inglorious artist branches into a sympathetic permutation, the noble struggling artist more familiar to us whose dedication to his art is so great that he ignores his material well-being in deference to the arts of the mind and the hand. And a less sympathetic and far more comedic charlatan artist, usually a young and plucky artist at the beginning of his career, 
who overestimates his abilities and is completely surprised by his poverty. At this point, the poverty of the artist became a given in satirical cultural representation, and as such, the enemy of the artist and the art world transforms to the creditor to whom the impoverished artist is always in debt and the art seller who steals the artist's profits. We find here an example of the stage and image overlapping in this image of the character Monsieur Fougère from the comic opera L'Intrigue Epistolaire or the Epistolary Intrigue by Fabre d'Eglantine first performed in 1802. Fougère is a painter of the least profitable but most expensive, most noble and most intellectually demanding genre of painting at the time, according to his contemporaries, history painting, large scenes of important episodes and military history in this case. Fougère's dedication to his art eclipses all and his family falls into poverty. The plot of the play is motivated by this poverty. The law attempts to seize the apartments and possessions of the indebted Fougère family, which catalyzes the epistolary intrigue between the play's young romantic protagonists. Neither playwrights nor illustrators could, however, resist poking fun, even at the struggling artist who nobly toils in indignity. The somber absorption of the painting Fougère clashes with his foppish painter's robes. And here, the titular image to this talk, Le Grand Diable Mammon d'Argent, Patron de la Finance, or the Great Money Devil, Mammon, Patron of Finance. Here, Mammon, a biblical representative of covetousness and the greedy pursuit of material wealth, showers money on an allegorical arrangement of Parisians. From left to right, the painter, a procureur or attorney, a wine merchant, a baker, a prostitute and her keeper kneeling below her, a cobbler, a tailor, and flying above them to the right, a law clerk. Our anonymous cartoonist exhibits little confidence in the talent of this young and handsome artist who wears his palette and brushes on his head and from which rats and moths sprout. Drawing upon iconography of poverty, imagination, and insanity, we are presented with an early depiction of the impoverished artist as charlatan. The law, the natural enemies of the indebted and often evicted impoverished artist resurfaces as the artist protagonist, uh, as the artist antagonist, excuse me. The painter remarks, je tire de fort près et ne puis rien avoir, le maudit procureur aura tout, or though I fire point blank, I will receive nothing, the damned attorney will receive everything. There's great thematic overlap between the subsequent two political regimes, the Napoleonic Empire and the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy that followed Napoleon's capitulations on the battlefield. Here, our relatively simple genealogy of types becomes more complex as the popular printed image and satirical image proliferated. Buoyed by the industrialization of paper production around 1800 and the introduction of the faster and cheaper lithographic print, invented in 1796 but popularized throughout Europe 20 years later. The satirical power of the enduring image of the noble struggling artist is rendered more explicit in this period. For instance, in this series, which narrated the life of the artist, we conclude with the young artist painting in his studio. He beckons the allegorical figure of glory to open the door as he cries, Entrez, madame, je travaille pour la gloire, or enter, ladies, I labor unto glory. The allegorical figure is a famine crouched on the floor with her hand in her mouth, and misery behind her join the artist, positioned as necessary precursors to achievement. In the Empire and Restoration, cartoonists present us with an exception to the rule of poverty. In contrast to the image of the noble struggling artist, we are presented a successful artist, a portraitist, a sellout who has forfeited his dignity for profit, submitting himself to the vanity and narcissism of the rich and painting silly portraits for them. As in this image of Lady Formite, a wordplay on deformity, and her dog Fidel or Loyal, a smartly dressed artist equally as deformed by early 19th century standards with elven ears, a jutting underbite, sloping nose and angry eyebrows carefully transcribes the image of his less than worthy city sitter. 
The representation of the artist as charlatan branched into subtypes. The sans souci artist or carefree artist is a rascal and a trickster indulging in the pleasures of the artist's marginalized existence to buck the rules, free of scrutiny, defying social norms and partaking in the libidinous pleasures of his liminality, as in this image of the painter and his model. With this half-naked model perched on his lap to better admire her own image, the carefree painter exclaims, vive les arts, or long live the arts. Another strain of the charlatan artist, and one of my favorites, is the delusional shop sign painter. Yes, this sounds a bit strained, but bear with me. The artist's shop sign painter borrows a bit from the sellout prostituting portraits portraitists since he produces shop signs for local stores, prostituting his talent for the commercial arts, and he samples the delusions of grandeur of the young charlatan artist unaware that his artistic production will never lead to glory. This satirical image draws from the 1814 vaudeville by Moreau de Comagny and A. M. La Forterelle, entitled Monsieur Crouton ou l'aspirant au salon. It told the story of an artist named Mr. Crouton who exclusively paints shop signs. Entirely unaware that this will never lead to artistic glory, he nonetheless submits all of his works to the salon exhibition of contemporary fine art at every opportunity. The publisher Martinet, also responsible for our image of Mr. Fougère, here illustrated another satirical artist from the popular stage. The slanted roof of Crouton studio indicates to us he lives in a mansard apartment, the cheap top story apartment in Parisian apartment buildings. The fragments of classical statuary pinned up on his walls suggest his perhaps only aspirational formation as a classical academic painter. And yet he paints shop sign after shop sign, all with indexical markers shepherding passers-by into the stores they're hung outside of. The subtitle of the image, Le Triomphe des Arts, or The Triumph of the Arts, is purely ironic. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for, the procession to the procession of art world antagonists, imperial and restoration imagery adds the bourgeoisie. In Bourdais's image, a pair of well-heeled and fashionable patrons enjoy a visit to the studio of a fictional painter who leans on his masterpiece, a tiny landscape painting encased in an absurdly elaborate frame. Easily impressed by shiny objects, superficiality, and glitter, the bourgeois visitors exclaim, c'est un morceau capital, or it's a capital piece. And I put this one in for you, Pat. Finally, a revolution in the summer of 1830 definitively toppled the restored Bourbon monarchy, replacing it with another monarchical lineage. The Orléans family, who established themselves as allies of the people during the French Revolution, Louis-Philippe d'Orléans took the throne, branding himself not king of France, but king of the French. And our cartoonists, which include a household name I'm sure many of you have been waiting for, Honoré Daumier, became markedly more direct in their imagery. Several branches of our inglorious artists subsequently coalesce in the image of the bohemian artist, where paradoxically, the nobility of the artist's struggle combines with the libidinous indulgences of the carefree artist. In Paul Gavarni's series Les Artistes, or The Artists, this scruffy artist grumpily answers his door, interrupted mid-painting by a prospective bourgeois patron. The caption transcribes their exchange. The bourgeois man asks what time he might visit without bothering the artist. The eccentric artist answers whenever you would like, in the morning from 4 to 5 a.m. And well, when do you have supper? The patron answers at 5 p.m. Yes, from 5 to 6 p.m., the bohemian artist replies, foolishly cutting off his nose to spite his face. To my delight, the trope of the delusional shop sign painter proliferated in this period but with a tragic patina. In the hands of Honoré Daumier, an older painter angrily gestures to a shop sign he has finished. A crowd has assembled gawking at his ouvrage as the painter exclaims, and I'll translate, and to say that I spent 15 years of my life copying the leg of the Apollo Belvedere to end up painting sweet bread on the shop sign of a grocer. I'd hoped to climb the social ladder otherwise. 
Here, the painter refers to his fastidious academic education dedicated to copying the arts of classical antiqui antiquity. And indeed, Daumier's shop sign painter even mimics the gesture of the revered Apollo Belvedere sculpture, a sculpture as which, as we have seen, was briefly in the collection of the Louvre Museum, brought there by Napoleon during the Revolutionary Wars, but repatriated to the Vatican Museum in 1815 upon Napoleon's second capitulation to European powers. And finally, to our roster of antagonists, July Monarchy cartoonists added the jury of the Salon exhibition. The Salon exhibition of contemporary art had, thanks to the intervention of arts administrators, become an increasingly important event that acted as gatekeeper to artistic success and membership within the art world. As the number of artists practicing in Paris rose, the Salon exhibition could no longer keep pace and the proportion of works rejected to works accepted widened significantly, as we see here where the green line on top represents the number of artists who submitted artwork and the blue line below it represents the number of artists who had works accepted to the exhibition over time. At the beginning of the July monarchy, the jury to the Salon exhibition was selected from a subsection of the Institut de France or French Institute, a still extant honorary society that inducted French thinkers, scientists, and artists in celebration of their lifelong achievements. Armed with this new satirical target, artists such as Jules Patier accused them all of blindness, picturing them with their eyes covered and being aided by support animals and rehashing this satire from nearly a century previous, which mocked one of Paris's earliest art critics, La Fond de saint yen for his mid 18th century commentaries on the growing decadence of artistic production. I have given you a snapshot of this complex genealogy, but have left out many other players within the cascading taxonomies of the satirized art world. The gawping art public, the sheer absence of women artists and their presence only as models and sex objects, the artist as craftsperson and more. At the risk of over bombarding you with images, you must permit me this indulgence for I would be remiss if I failed to share with you how the artists turned cartoonists of my corpus inserted themselves within the genre of art world satire. Picturing themselves in Manonfant's case as aspiring history painters actually working up much smaller paintings from which they were distracted by the necessity to produce more profitable lithographs or in Raffet's much more chaotic version where the lithographic prints that the artist produces and which the public ravenously consumes actually ultimately destroy the artist's chances of ever being inducted into the silhouetted Institut de France, the Honorary Society of Lifetime Achievement or of Apotheosis in the Tomb of the Greats, the Pantheon, both pictured here. The printmaker in the foreground targets both with albums loaded into the mortar he has just lighted or lit. <laughs> Throughout these images and through the image of the starving artist, artists turned illustrators highlighted a crucial discrepancy that Pierre Bourdieu in 1993 commenting on the contemporary art market would later describe as the economy of, of symbolic goods. This is an art market in which the logic of the pre-capitalist economy lives on, or in other words, one where cultural or symbolic goods are trafficked as commodities, but where we espouse a discourse and aesthetics of disinterestedness, that we take pleasure in these objects, not because of their commercial value, but because of their aesthetic value, their beauty, their intellectual enrichment. Cartoonists use the extremely apt medium of satire swiveling a spotlight on these strategies for negating art status as a commercial object, while nonetheless expecting artists to participate in economies of competitive individualism. After defending my dissertation and starting a postdoctoral fellowship, I returned to Paris in October, 2017, the last time I was there, to indulge my desire to do one last little scan through my favorite image collections to ensure I'd really found all I could before plunging into revisions for the book manuscript I am currently polishing up. And for the record, I had 489 images when I went and left with 530, so I don't regret it. I had recently published a scholarly article where I revisited Walter Benjamin's arguments 
about the work of art in the age of its mechanical reproducibility. It continues to influence my approach to the study of the printed image, encouraging me to emphasize the materiality of the image. And this emphasis on materiality pervades the way I construct my lectures, as you've all experienced here. Just as my art world satires insist on rendering visible the invisible structures that underpin their art world, I insist on revealing to you all the materiality of my research process, a process that we scholars generally keep to ourselves. In 2017 in Paris, the departments of prints and photographs had migrated from the high ceilinged living room like space where I had been toiling and excavating for eight years, a space that I had come to know like the back of my hand. It was then temporarily relocated to the Salle La Brust, a breathtaking reading room in the Richelieu building of the French National Library, a stone's throw from the Paris Opera and the Louvre Museum. As I waited for my documents to be brought out to me, I admired the space. I experienced that odd upside down vertigo one feels when one chances to look up and admire the sky. The recently restored painted ceilings of the Salle La Brousse transported me to a time much closer to the period that I study. This was not the first time that the Salle La Brousse welcomed readers from the French National Library or Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And it was not the first time that a student of the pieces on the arts folios looked up and admired the ceiling and with it, the recursion of the historical process, the looping of the timeline upon itself those precious moments where we become so involved in our study subject that the line of time lifts up, curves around, and circles back on itself to tie a fleeting bow. Walter Benjamin remarked in the Arcades Project, the painted foliage on the ceilings of the Bibliothèque Nationale, as one leafs through the pages down below, it rustles up above. As I work on this project, these echoes and resonances slowly reveal themselves to me. I feel an intense kinship with the artist illustrators of my art world satirical corpus. My undergraduate degree is not in art history, it's in studio arts. And it was in a reading group organized alongside a painting studio class that I was first exposed to the writings of Pierre Bourdieu and first found a companion who had also noticed this strangely political art world that I was encountering for the first time living in Montreal. One that I found perplexing, alienating and intimidating one that ultimately dissuaded me from pursuing a career as an artist. My art world satirists were, with great nuance and intelligence, pluck and wit, attacking power dynamics and hypocrisies in a language that made me feel my concerns and the concerns of many artists had in fact long been heard. They asked a question that I still ask, that many artists, theorists and historians have asked, but that we can't, haven't found an answer to, can art really escape its own commerciality? And why do we pretend it can? Is art destined to be marginalized and exploited in a capitalist economy? Satire is an intensely creative genre and collages meaning in agile and elegant ways, but its creativity is critical, destructive. It picks apart, it dismantles, it reveals internal inconsistencies, hypocrisies, insincerities. Not one of these 530 satirical images proposes a solution to the problems they reveal. But the sheer volume of the corpus, the urgency of their inquiries, the inventiveness of their criticism reminds us that we must continue asking. Thank you. So thank you. Um, if you have a, a question or comment, just put your name in the chat and We'll get to you. We can have a conversation in that way. Anybody? Thank you. Anybody yet? Oh. Um. So did you keep, was it complicated to keep track of which of these cartoon makers were kind of aspired to higher art and which were utter, I mean, their reaction to the, um, 
whether they were looking at the art world as outsiders or as, as um, people who couldn't make it in the art world, sort of sour grapes. Is that something you could figure out? Because a lot of these, some of these were clearly academically trained and some seem like very primitive, uh, maybe untrained yeah. caricatures. I mean, authorship in this corpus really ended up depending on the period that I was looking at. So the earlier my images are, the more likely they are to be anonymous. And the later in this period, the more likely they are to have a clear author who is sort of proudly sign their name. Um, and that has a lot to do with the kind of history of the printed image and the history of, of censorship across this period. and political regime, the status of the illustrator. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying that for my earlier images, um, my 18th and, and very, very early 19th century imagery, in most cases, I couldn't actually determine who the author was. It wasn't particularly clear. Um, but in some of those cases, it might have been a kind of more of an imagier um, kind of figure. Um, so somebody who is working um, as we would understand it now, more as an illustrator um, and not really having much success as a fine artist. Um, but in our later images, you know, I showed you an image by Eugène Le Poitvin, the, um, the image, I guess I can rifle back to it, but I find it so annoying when other people do that, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> but who, um, it just like takes up a lot of time and then you're sitting there being like, okay, you can just keep talking. Um, but I've, I've shown you images from, you know, Eugène de Poitvin, who had the image of, um, of the devil carrying the museum on his back, um, painted landscapes and naval scenes and was well known for this. But in his, um, his life as a, a cartoon illustrator, um, as, a, as, a satir as a satirist, he painted a lot of kind of titillating images of women um, engaging with devils in, in sort of... Um, acts that that would elicit a little bit of a frisson so um it's i mean it's it's a difficult question to answer i'm i'm not sure if if you know kind of anger at, at not being successful can in uh, alone explain um the motives of all of these uh these uh these cartoonists um right. yeah that seems compl complicated, right? There's a question from uh, Patricia Minardi, if she's there. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Maybe if you close your um, your presentation, I can try to open up uh, the gallery yeah. so we can see the everybody. Thanks. All right, we're out. <clears throat> Hi. So. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just had a question about uh, caricatures of successful artists, because there's, as you know, there are a lot of caricatures, which can be pretty vicious about artists who are either society artists or academic artists or salon artists, successful artists. I mean, how does that inflect what you're talking about? I know it's not your subject, but mm -hmm. I mean, how do you feel about that relationship? of this other corpus of satires of artists. Yeah. So, I mean, in my hunts, I found that I have a few, I have few images that go after David and David seems to have been, you know, one of the more popular targets if if a recognizable individual artist was going to be targeted, Jacques Louis David tended to be it and it made sense he was, you know, played such an important role, played such an important political role during the French Revolution, and his students went on, um, his sort of leading students went on to have such an impact on the art world. Um, but I found that that images against him didn't feel, first of all, they, they were much lower in number than the quantity of images that I found that kind of satirized the idea of the artist or the idea of an art patron or the idea of a connoisseur. I didn't find them in anything near the the same volume, so it seemed as though that I, really did feel like a separate strain of production. Uh huh. Um, I just um, think it might it might actually strengthen your argument to 
contrast it with what the caricaturists disliked about successful artists. Mm -hmm. uh, what I have found, I mean, Domier did several of them, is the artificiality of their product, how they're pandering mm -hmm. to the collector. That, that's the, the point of it seems to be that they're not um, truthful artists. And yeah. also the, the dandy quality of their dress. You know, One of the accusations I see a lot in the, the kind of periodical press, the cultural periodical press um, during the July monarchy, a term that I've encountered quite a bit that I'm excited to, to keep delving into is the notion of an artistic arist aristocracy. Um, and that, you know, leveling that accusation against a successful artist um, in the post-revolutionary period has so much more weight to it to kind of affiliate, associate an artist to the notion of nobility and aristocracy from the pre-revolutionary period that we're all relieved to have abandoned um, uh, is quite damning. So that, yeah, we should talk more. Back on the salon um, and also on, on um, the academy, just the political attack. Yeah. Uh, by Absolutely, the way, yeah. Crouton, you know, crouton is a play on the word croute, which is like- Yes. And so Monsieur Crouton, by his very name, is an artist who, who turns out garbage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it was common for, um, I mean, if you look this up in 18th and 19th century dictionaries, if you look up crouton or croute, you get two definitions. And one is, you know, a hard little piece of bread that nobody wants that, that can be used in food in some ways and shitty art. Yeah. Those are the two definitions of crouton. Um, in the 18th and 19th century dictionary. So we should just bring that back. There was a question from uh, Amy. Uh, Amy. Uh, Amy. Yes, okay. Thank you so much. It was a superb talk. And, and I'm not a gusher, but this was really excellent. And I look forward to your book. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one, a small one, Hippolyte um, Flandrin. Is that the same Hippolyte Flandrin who's known for his very official murals? Yes. Oh, so that brings me to something that's interested me because the artist I write about did secret, secretly did caricatures and cartoons, Puvis de Chavon. And um, yes. did you find a lot of, or some even, um, artists who are known for more official, you know, or maybe slightly smug or whatever, uh, who also did, um, uh, you know, secretly, let's say, or privately, or didn't really want to be known for uh, the caricatures or satires and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess, you know, my favorite example of that is unfortunately not a 19th century example. It's an 18th century example, but I have that's several okay. images in my corpus from the Comte de Cadus. Um, who enjoyed, you know, contributing, you know, throwing his word in on the art world. And he, of course, um, was uh, kind of an early archaeologist. The profession didn't quite exist at the time. Um, and a, an amateur wrote extensively on the arts and was in the art academy as an administrator and celebrated in that way and supported artists, um, but also, um, you know, kind of dove into the fray and produced some some really interesting etchings uh, that are kind of nasty and really mean. Um, and a few of those have entered into my corpus and, and I love them. Huh. And my second question was the distribution of these. You talked about they came in books or albums, I guess. Um, were any of them just sold singly and that sort of thing? And uh, I, I have no idea how they were distributed. Yeah. Well, I can answer that, but I also have to refer you to Patricia Minardi's book, Another World, um, where she speaks extensively on this. But um, these, the, this corpus was really fun to work on because the format um, that these characters came in changed so vastly across the time period. So uh, my earliest imagery, my 18th century imagery um, tends to be clandestined and loose leaf. So they would be kind of available secretly, um, difficult to purchase um, as loose leaf imagery. 
the album formats, um, which you saw in the Rafé uh, print, was popular during the restoration um, and a little and sort of weaned off um, in the July monarchy. And that format was extremely, extremely popular for about a decade. Um, uh, was published um, at the end of the calendar year and was available as a kind of New Year's Eve uh, gift um, that you might buy for members of your family, for children, for adults. We're usually sold in packs of 12, so kind of like not really a calendar, but um, mm. but the notion was there. And um, oh, thanks, Lee. And uh, um, but so many other formats were available as well. You know, if you, of course, know La Caricature and Le Charivari and the satirical periodical press um, where lithographs would be printed in with text. Um, but you could also go to the Maison Aubert print shop and ask to buy them individually as prints if you really liked them, but not if they were published from La Caricature. La Caricature subscribers um, benefited from a monopoly on the prints that were included in their, um, their publications. So these came in, in many, many formats. Um, and when you study them en masse like this, you really get to, a chance to see how publishers experimented with formats to see what had traction, um, how they could encourage people to buy more. And another question, if I might, I don't know if in England, like Cruikshank and people like that, is there anything, is that maybe another volume of your study, uh, but is it similar? Do, do artists come in for how they're portrayed or self-portrayed or so forth? I mean, in a yeah. caricatural, satirical way. They do. I spent some time, um, I spent about a month at the Lewis Walpole Library um, in, in Connecticut. Um, trying to answer this question, I really wanted to see if I could branch out um, and and look at what was happening in London. Um, and um, it's, I mean, I, I don't specialize in English art history, so I don't feel comfortable answering this question definitively. I could definitely have searched more, but I didn't really see um, English cartoonists attacking their art world with the same sort of focus and bite um, as French cartoonists did. I do think that genre, that subgenre took off a little bit more in Paris um, than it did in England. Um, although I have to say that I think Hogarth must be one of the most satirized artists of all time. They, they just really couldn't get enough of making fun of him in print. So that happened quite a lot. Thank you so much. It was an extraordinarily good talk. Thank you, it was excellent. Oh, thank you, so kind of you to say. Can I add mm -hmm. um, something about the uh, artists drawing caricatures? Because, you know, Delacroix did caricatures that were published in his youth, and then he stopped. Mm -hmm. And my understanding yeah. is that almost all artists did humorous drawings. I've seen many drawings, like somebody, somebody like Do uh, Daubigny, maybe not Angra. But artists did humorous drawings, but the watershed is, did they publish them? Was it just oh yeah, totally. Friends and Delacroix actually published them. I have a chapter that's in the dissertation, but I've I'm removing it for the book and I'll publish it separately. But on this kind of private caricature phenomenon, I think it was really um, a part of the the formation of the artist in a way that um, if you were successful enough to be sent off to the Academy of France in Rome. Um, it was kind of a, almost a hazing ritual or a rite of passage to caricature your friends in drawing and to be caricatured yourself. Um, and when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You're spending all of your time um, copying and drawing um, figures of classical antiquity. Your hand becomes kind of so practiced in the act of copying the human form that it must feel a little bit like um, like uh, this impossible to resist delight to just kind of uh, manipulate those abilities to make somebody extremely grotesque. Um, and so I've, I've run into many examples. Yeah, and Pat, I have that chapter and I'd, I'd love to send it to you because I found some really cool stuff at the BANF I don't think people have looked at in a while um, that of caricaturists drawing one another. These weren't published for the most part. They almost seem to have been exchanged um, amongst each other as kind of friendship bracelets. Um, 
Notes, which is a reference that is soon going to be totally outdated, but I hope everyone here um, knows, still knows what they were. I don't think uh, Gen Z knows about friendship bracelets. Um, but you would, you know, draw this funny drawing of your friend who's also an art student in Rome and you're all on this kind of strange tour together where your family is far away and you can do whatever you want. And, you know, one of the, the ways that you're being feisty is by drawing silly drawings of each other and then copy it and you keep a copy and your friend keeps a copy. And this becomes a sort of testament to this time that you had together. Um, that when you return to Paris and go your separate ways, you can keep. And so I've, I've found many examples of that in the 18th um, and 19th century. And I believe the French Academy in Rome actually keeps, um, there's um, this great article that looks at 20th century examples of this. So I think that that remained a tradition of students at the French Academy of Rome for centuries to caricature one another and to caricature um, their experiences. I think it's part of, of art student culture because yeah. it, wherever there were a group of art students hanging out together all day, every day, that was like a funny thing you did was to make funny drawings of each other. And I've just, yeah. you know, it, I've just seen it over and over again in, uh, in 19th century France. I'm sure it's still going on today. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Um, but doing that question I don't from, know La did it in when I was in from Lorraine wait did you ask if they're still doing that today yeah, this art well student. today cartoons are a part of the academy so it's completely turned on its head I mean it's a serious you can have a serious career as a, in the academy as a cartoonist so I don't know what that means but no we do serious drawings of each other now Oh, okay. We do That's academic drawings of each other. Now you make uh, angra esque drawings. Right. <laughs> There's a question from Lorraine uh, Gibert. Is she there? No. Another question from David Berger. Hi. Oh, unmute yourself. Sorry. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, I could try to do it for you. I got it. Great. Uh, yeah, I uh, love the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it dovetails right into the work, some of the work that Paul Buell and I did on the uh, bo Bohemians. And uh, what's interesting is that just at the point where you leave off at the late 1840s, 1850, is where the Bohemian as a type emerges in the character of Henry Mergen and the people around him. And yeah. also, interestingly enough, quite quickly crosses over to the United States in the person of Henry Platt. So it's a wonderful introduction to how early all the stuff goes. For me, it probably goes all the way back to Villon, <laughs> uh, people around him, because the tradition of French other artists, outsider art, goes back a hell of a long time. And uh, yeah. just... Uh, fabulous that uh, you can trace so minutely the uh, the progress of how this all came about and finally just explodes after the revolution of 1848 and Bohemia like hippiedom uh, or the beat generation becomes uh, kind of a thing uh, a popular thing among young people so thank you yeah very absolutely thank you oh very yeah thank you question from uh, Stefan Stella Stefan Roy Sure. Hi. Hi, Catherine. Uh, that Hi, was Stephen. quite that was quite impressive. You've uh, you've <laughs> built quite a corpus of images for yourself. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, so you'll be surprised by my question. So I was wondering, you know, where would uh, print publishers fit in your survey of the art world? This is this is a really surprising question coming from you, Stefan. Um, but uh, where do print publishers fit in my survey of the art world? So, um, so yeah, they actually... You... No, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, sorry. No, I was just wondering because you know, we've had those discussions uh, you know, many years ago about you know, print publishers being uh, pushed away from the art world 
but also enabling artists to, you know, to have their uh, uh, designs and paintings, you know, made uh, uh, known to a broader public by, you know, commissioning engravers to make engravings from those paintings. So I was just wondering, uh, you know, where would those print publishers fit? Yeah. I mean, in the, I guess the, the most obvious example that comes to mind is the case of Philippon, Charles Philippon, who, um, who was a part, one of the heads of the Maison Aubert publishing house um, that was responsible for so much imagery um, from the 1830s, especially onwards, um, and really founded this, you know, established a kind of monopoly in many ways on lithographic printing in Paris. Um, and Philippon, really met um, his, his illustrators, he met his artists as an art student um, at the studio of, of Jean Toingro, um, who was um, himself one of David's students who we referred to earlier. So um, those worlds, um, the world of the publisher and of um, the artist um, really are not so separate at all, although we, we do now represent them in that way, uh, Philippon is a really ideal example um, of how instrumental, in fact, that overlap was um, for the success um, of, of his dynasty, although he seems to have made enemies of, of most of them after a few years, I think, through um, we're demanding a bit too much editorial control. So, you know, as you're tracking their publications, suddenly, you know, Charlet and, and everyone that he was working with initially start finding somebody else to publish with um, after, you know, 1835. So um, maybe Philippon got, got a little too excited um, about his power grab. But these worlds are definitely connected. And the Gros caricature that I started with kind of demonstrates that I, I really haven't found a published image um, as unique as that Gros caricature. So I really feel like my obsession with it has been, you know, retroactively justified. But um, in, in all of my search and all of these 530 caricatures, the Gros caricature is the only one that I found a second edition for where they exhausted the first plate and said, you know what, we actually haven't made fun of him enough. We're gonna make this again and do it again. You know, we, we want 2000 of these out in the world, not just 1,000. There needs to be more making fun of Greuze here. Um, and of course, the catalyst for all of that is Greuze's mistreatment of a young printmaker. Um, so uh, that, I mean, just the, the kind of satirical force of that image that not only goes after Greuze, but in the lettering, it goes after his wife. They really, like, they really could not pile on enough insults um, because Le Vasseur had been paid half as much as a former uh, printmaker who'd worked with Creuse had been paid. Um, so yeah, the, the print world is, was ready to kind of protect their own and go after it. Those worlds were extremely intertwined and, and very, very necessary to each other and really can't be separated. I have another um, comment. I feel like Sure. Okay. I think Elizabeth had a question a long time ago, but I'm has sorry. her hand down. Elizabeth, are you still here? I'm scanning the names. I am. Thank you. Um, I think there are other questions in the chat too, though. So, but thank you for calling on me. Um, thank you for this presentation. It was really, really beautiful. And I love how you kind of gave us a little bit of insight into your research process as well, which was really beautiful. I have two really quick questions on the kind of idea about successful artists, failed artists, anonymous artists. In your research, did you look at all at the census data as to who was actually officially considered an artist to get a sense? So I believe, um, unfortunately, the census data for that doesn't quite exist um, oh. in the period that I'm studying. So I think that censuses are more commonly taken um, in the later 19th century and not in the 18th and early. And I would, I wish that data really existed because I really want to see, you know, you could see, you know, I have an inclination towards uh, graphs and charts and I like them and I would love to make a graph and chart about this too, but I can't. And it, it haunts me every day, you know, I'll like wake up in the middle of the night and be like, but were there more artists? Were they becoming poor? I mean, I can't, I can't really verify 
anything that my images tell me. So I have to sort of represent them as cultural representation. So I don't know. And I wish I did. And I, I sad that I don't. Um, so but my, no one wanted to count people, unfortunately. They just weren't into counting people yet. Right. It, that's interesting. I guess that kind of reveals I'm a contemporary um, scholar because the census data is, I can rely on census data if need be. Um, my second question was, is how was kind of race depicted or addressed in, in, in these satires? So in the images that I've looked at, alongside the existence of women artists, race is already is also entirely ignored. And I think those absences are really important and interesting in this imagery that um, in so many ways, I feel so much kinship uh, with the kind of questions that these images pose. But I also recognize that they are quite dedicated to trying to sort of paint a narrative in which women artists don't exist. And they very, very much did. Um, but they don't, they really do not tackle race in almost any way. I believe I have one caricature in which a black sitter, portrait sitter is pictured and that's it across 530 images. I think I saw it, that's why it made me because it jumped out the black body yeah. was of this, you know, in a sea of white bodies. I think I kind of caught it and that's what made me think to ask because obviously French society at that moment, I'm not an expert in that, but obviously there were black people and people of color in France in some capacity, I'm sure. Um, so, but to completely erase their presence is interesting or not, not yeah. think to include their presence is interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the omissions are really important um, and really significant. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. What's the information? Emmy, is that? Well, but I, I, I was just taken very much with the idea of the presentation of the artist and the sat satiring, satirization of artists. And I was just wondering whether it made me think that in Cezanne's, and I'm thinking of Manet showing himself as extremely elegant, etc. but Cezanne showing himself as a rustic. And I wonder if there might be a little bit of self-satirization or not, I don't know in Cezanne showing himself, you know, and actually you think of others, I guess, but then there's no end to it. Uh, ben Hoch showing himself as just a country lad or something. Of course, there's so many self-portraits then. Um, so uh, just any thoughts you might have on that, maybe? I mean, I know that this imagery really, um, This imagery has really kind of brought to light for me that um, artists are, hmm, I'm trying to find a way of, of saying this sentence that make, so that it makes sense. But I think, I know I as an art historian have tended to imagine that I could somehow know more about the context that my artist is creating work in than they did. And I feel like looking at this work and seeing the sort of the level of um, interest and awareness of structural change um, and administrative change really demonstrates to me that these cartoonists were very um, engaged in and involved in uh, the administration of their art world. Um, they're, I, and all of that is to say, I think that they're just paying a lot of attention and they're paying attention to the discrepancies between their experience and the representation of the artist. Um, and so in that light, I'm sure that that tradition continues and that there's an awareness that there's a kind of cachet in representing oneself as rustic and that that can be um, played with. Mm. Compliqué. C'est toujours compliqué. <laughs> I have a, just a question for you. I know at one point you were um, making huge databases of all of this. And you yes. talked at one point of making them available. Are you still thinking about that? Or what's the status of that? Yeah, I still very much want to make these available. And I've been investigating strategies for doing this. There is not a way 
it's not possible for me to just publish the Envivo database online. That isn't something that Envivo um, can really support. Um, and and it's, it's not really a part of, of the design of the software, um, but I can translate um, this database, um, the question, and I mean, of course, it's always possible to, to, you know, try to create a web space that, that hosts this. The question is, what can I do as an academic that is feasible um, and that doesn't cost the whole bunch of money and require a bunch of specialties and that doesn't um, invent the, reinvent the wheel, but the utility I'm gravitating to right now is called Omeka. And it's, um, it's a, research tool it's a it's a web-based sort of research space that's intended for scholars and museums and libraries to make collections available online for people to navigate um, and so it would be relatively it would be rel it would be simpler than you'd think for me to translate my database and make it available using omeka um, and so the plan is to publish the book and publish the database simultaneously. Uh -huh. And I do believe that publishing the database will be a lot easier than publishing the book, actually. Um, but that the database will be ready to go before the book huh. proofs are in hand. Um, so I've been doing that investigating. I have a lot of really generous uh, library friends that I've made over the course of just being a total dork for the last, you know, 15 years of my life who have helped me a lot and shown me different utilities and guided me. And, um, and I've kind of negotiated for support on that at UNC Chapel Hill. So the structures are in place um, for that to all, uh, uh, you know, become available. Well, keep us posted. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, I want you to see it. I want you to rummage through it and find cool stuff. Anxiously awaiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really, really want to share it. I feel like it would be so absurd to sit on 530 images um, that I found and not share them. I, I'm also, you know, I published several articles on them. I'm going to publish a book. And I will always love them and keep a place in my heart for them, but I am so ready to move on and work on other pictures. So I would like to release them into the world and let other people um, make meaning with them. Sounds good to me. Yeah. I'll go make another database. Okay. Who is going to publish the book? Um, I'm still in the courting publishers phase. Um, so I have a couple of, of um, publishers who've asked to see chapter samples. Um, and that is uh, Penn State or Penn, yeah, PSU and Bloomsbury. And I have somebody else that I will approach. I was talking with Yale, but they, um, they were not interested after looking at chapter samples. So that, that option is, is off the table. Shame on them. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, I no, seriously, be... seriously, because I published with Yale, it was taken over by more of a money making thing. I don't know if you know the whole history. And there are those of us who, well, I could tell you at great at length, but I won't at this juncture. And there were many of us who signed a petition saying that uh, it, it's a very interesting history, actually. They decided. Uh, it should be more of a money maker. Oh, and I can tell you at great length. Very. And they're great. I will, I will email you. Well, seriously, do. I, I will tell you. Okay. And I'd love to hear. Okay. Yeah. I will spew forth. <laughs> I Isn't appreciate a funny it. Picture? Oh, come on. <laughs> Cullum is a cartoonist. We have a cartoonist in our midst from Durham, North Carolina. He's a friend of mine. And he, oh, that is a great cartoon, Cullum. Oh my God. I don't know is if everyone may, can see it. Is that a satire the... of, of um, art historians? I have been careful. Yeah, another? I guess so. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, 
No, it's just a poetry. It has <laughs> oh, no satirical awesome. intent. So much. <laughs> no, no, it has no point. It's not a good cartoon. It's just. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's a memento of tonight. Yes, right. I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Cullen. It's good okay. to have a cartoonist here. I, I was writing this thinking of that. Well, Ben's a cartoonist. He's a famous cartoonist. Yeah, yeah there, there are quite yeah, a few course, cartoonists of here. Of course. There are a few cartoonists in the audience. But anyway, um, any, any other comments or questions? Or, um, that was a great talk. Great talk. One quick question. Thank you. So much, oh, there's everyone. a question. Fabulous. I was just wondering if uh, the the way the artists have seen themselves and the starving artist motif over the years. I mean, I know this is just your specialty, but uh, is do you see similarities today with the way artists treat themselves or in satirical drawings or there's satire about art? I know there's an entire book of punch cartoons. Uh, uh, someone. George Melly put together an anthology of punch cartoons about artists, and the title mm. of it was A Child of Six Could Do It. Yes. Uh, dealing with yeah. the reaction to modern art. The, the idea that, I mean, that I don't see in these 500 drawings you've shown us the idea that art itself is kind of a fraud. The, the there whole... are, so I do actually have a few images that are along that theme of A Child of Six Could Do It mm -hmm. um, that might not have been. Um, you know, I just had this weird desire to see what would happen if I took 530 images and made a video with them um, and then, you know, bombarded people with them. And I have a whole bunch of different, I have a 20 second version where all 530 go by in 20 seconds. That was the one minute and 30 second version. Um, but they, there, I have an image, a few images nestled in there of proud mothers with their very young children who've produced um stick figure drawings mm -hmm. and who are absolutely certain that they've just discovered their child as a genius and needs to be you know ferried away to um to be formed further by uh <laughs> by uh, we've got a few people who are who are keeling over at that one <laughs> need to be formed further so that their genius can be cultivated um and they can become the famous artists they were clearly always destined to be so that that as has already um, so I, I see many of the seeds of um, artist jokes and starving artist tropes that we now delight in today were really kind of planted in this period and I was really kind of shocked by how thoroughly these cartoonists anticipated what we would still be joking about um, hundreds of years later. Yeah, but a child of six could draw it is in there. <laughs> Thank you. It is in there. And I don't think they knew how much funnier that would become eventually. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, right. thank you again and see everybody next week. Um, and uh, I can't remember what's happening next week. I'm blanking, <laughs> but we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Stefan. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night.